Now I will be talking about coronavirus disease 19 and digestive system. And I must thank for giving me this opportunity because as we spread more and more knowledge on this disease, maybe this is how we'll be able to overcome it. So knowledge is required and its implementation by every citizen of the country is required. Obviously, because I'm talking about coronavirus disease 19 and digestive system, I have to focus a lot on science rather than public. Now, if you look at coronavirus and the countries affected, now look at this. As of January 20, 2020, the four countries were affected. These were China and the adjoining countries such as Taiwan and Japan and so on. But quickly, in February 15, less about a month, 28 countries got affected, including North America, where it really created an upon. As of March 1, 2020, 60 countries were affected, and as of March 2020, 165 countries were affected. Obviously, today we are in June 9th. This figure is much more than 200. Why did the virus spread so much? Now, one of the reasons, one of the reasons, many reasons are there, but one of the reasons is it's great infectivity. I have a to see an algorithm which has so much infected potential. Now, you look at this how does infection occur in humans? Now, obviously, it started from Wuhan, China. Where in Wuhan and Wuhan, China, we don't really know. This is a matter of investigation. The popular belief or popular hypothesis that is being projected onto us is that it started from eating bat meat. But also, people say it is tangled in meat. Pangolin is a protected animal. It can't be killed as per law. But we all know what is happening to the animals in the heart in spite of many laws trying to protect them. Pangolins are illegally trafficked. A trafficking of pangolin illegally happens where these are the favorite dishes. Now, if you look at the science, the bad coronavirus has much less homology than the pangolin coronavirus. So the pangolin coronavirus is more homologous to the virus that we are seeing in human today. Now, even then, it is not 100% homology. It is less than 98% or 97% homology. Now, the popular belief is that in some parts of the world, Bat and pangolins are eaten and even eaten raw. And therefore, they suggest that this virus entered the GI tract and caused the infection. If it is true, then what does it mean? The virus can spread through GI tract. This is what I want to spread. Once somebody gets infected, then the transmission happens from person to person by aerosol. And that's why we are doing social distancing. We are applying face masks because we have to prevent spread by aerosol. Now, what does this virus do? The virus enters into the cell using a spike protein. Can you see all these spikes in the surface of the virus? This spikes protein can attach to angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Also, transmembrane serine protease is another receptor through which this virus enters into the cell. Once it enters into the cell, by endocytosis, it produces an endosome. Now, this virus actually it uh, uh, breaks the receptor, and the receptor contains sialic acid, and therefore it leads to acidification of the endosome. And this acidification releases the RNA of the virus. 
once the rna of the virus is released into the, into the cell what it does is it causes cytokine storm it causes a lot of cytokines to be liberated cytokines are the protein which are liberated by the cells particularly inflammatory cells and they affect several body system including respiratory system cardiovascular system and gi system and so on now just last week a study came in frontier which showed that if those who have mild or moderate disease compared to those who have critical disease or those who died you, you can see t cell population is getting tremendously reduced what does it mean because of constant stimulation by whatever mechanism the virus does actually there is a exhaustion of the t cells because if you stimulate anybody to do more and more work is going to be exhausted so t cell gets exhausted and as you can see the exhaustion become a higher and higher or greater and greater and the rate increases now what is the situation in covid 19 in india this is a paper published on 22nd may 2020 and that time this was the situation in india but obviously we have passed more than two weeks and our situation as far as the infectivity and the cases are concerned is really worse than what it was when this paper was published the question is why does this corona virus to or sars cov 2 what is sars cov 2 the virus name is severe acute respiratory distress syndrome corona virus 2 that's why we say sars cov 2 severe acute respiratory distress syndrome is sars corona we take co from there cov is for b virus for virus and two why two because in 2003 or 4 there was another corona virus that came before mars so there was a middle east virus that was called mars and before that there was another sars and that was 2003 and 2004 because this is the second sars virus sars corona virus that's why we are saying it is sars cov 2 now i told you sars cov 2 virus enters inside the cell through angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor an angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor it is not only located in respiratory epithelium but is also present in the esophagus in the small bowel and in the colon so why should actually corona virus not enter to the gi tract in fact if we believe the hypothesis that the first infection happened by eating the animal meat then it says that the first time in the human it entered to the gi tract and not respiratory tract but obviously this is just a hypothesis or conjecture another reason you have to believe that sars cov 2 and angiotensin 2 receptor is tremendous importance in relation to, to sars cov 2 because people have shown young children during the epidemic do not get affected easily by the virus second is even if they get infected by the virus they remain asymptomatic this is related to the fact that angiotensin converting enzyme 2 gene expression in the nasal epithelium is much less in young children than in older population so therefore there is a one is to one relationship between angiotensin converting 2 receptor enzyme 2 receptor and the infectivity by this virus and the severity of the illness now does gi symptom or do gi symptoms occur in covid 19 covid full form is corona virus disease co is for corona vi for virus and d is for disease so the disease is called covid 19 whereas the virus is called sars cov 2 we medical scientists use a technology called meta analysis where we pull all the studies published in the literature and then pull their patient population into one study 
and do a statistical analysis. That's why it is called meta-analysis. Meta means later. Meta means subsequently. Meta means another. So actually, you are analyzing the data separately or subsequently of all the data that, be, that have been published. And this is a meta-analysis of 60 studies on 4,243 patients on SARS-CoV-2. This meta-analysis was published in gastroenterology from Hong Kong. And this showed anorexia was present in 26% patients, nausea and vomiting 10%, diarrhea in 12%, abdominal pain in 9%, and as high as 17% patient had at least one GI symptom. So that means if somebody does not have respiratory symptom, don't ignore. Acute GI symptom may, means corona, may mean coronavirus infection. So pool prevalence of GI symptom is 17%. But suppose severe disease is associated with more frequent occurrence of GI symptom according to some studies, but this meta-analysis found no, there is no relationship of severity of COVID-19 and GI symptom. But obviously this meta-analysis included a lot of poor quality studies, a lot of case series, a lot of studies which were retrospective, and you take this result with a pinch of salt. Now remember one more thing. We all often develop common cold. And in the common cold, you get sore throat, you get pain in your throat, you get difficulty in swallowing, you get running nose, and all these are also symptoms of coronavirus. So now tell me, how do you say, is it SARS-CoV-2 infection or is it common cold? Because as the days evolve, we are going to have winter in India, and winter means a lot of patients will have actually all those common cold kind of illness. Two symptoms. One is if somebody lose male while having upper respiratory symptoms. So you are feeling like not smelling anything. The smell is not coming in your nose. Suspect that this is SARS-CoV-2 infection. Second is if you lose your taste, that means you are taking sweet, you are taking bitter, you are taking chili, and there is no sense in your tongue, SARS suspect SARS-CoV-2 infection. But what happens is this symptom has high degree of specificity. That means if you have it, we are reasonably right or reasonably sure that you have this infection. But if you don't have it, we are not sure that you don't have this infection because these symptoms don't occur very commonly. This is one study published in Lancet Gastroenterology Hepatology, where they found if a patients of SARS-CoV-2 infection have diarrhea, usually it is indicative of a severe illness. It is indicative of a severe illness. There is a meta-analysis which is going to be published in a month. And this meta-analysis has been done by one of the Indian scientists from Delhi. And what he found is that if somebody has diarrhea or any other GI symptom, it indicates severe illness. Second is if somebody has high liver enzyme, that means liver function test abnormality. This suggests that the fellow have severe COVID-19. Now, I want to know our data because you said that you want to get uh, knowledge from people who have been working on this. And I tell you, much of this data belongs to Professor Ujjola Ghosal, who is also my wife, and she is the head of the Department of Microbiology at SGPGI Lucknow. In one month time, before 17th May 2020, she tested 16,317 samples. Now, of these samples, 3,000 samples came from SGPGI. That is 3,000 people visited SGPGI to get their coronavirus testing done. But about 12,000 people, their sample were brought from the district through a program called Integrated Disease Surveillance Program. This is a program which India government runs. Whenever there is an outbreak, the district hospital or even peripheral hospital get help, get connected through the 
best institute in the country in each state. And the samples are brought to SGPGI, for example, and then tested, their results are given, and we give advice as well. So we found of this 16,317 sample tested in our lab, 252 were positive. That means 252 patients were diagnosed as COVID-19 till May 17, 2020 at SGPGI Department of Microbiology. And I tell you, 82% of these subjects were asymptomatic. And let me tell you, asymptomatic, if the, a disease is asymptomatic, that means there is no symptom, there is no illness that the patient feels, and the disease or infection is highly infectious, the organism is highly infectious, it is very difficult to control. Because on one side, there is no symptom. The other side, it is highly infectious. There is no way you can control that disease, okay? Because it is difficult. Because you are talking with somebody and that somebody is actually already having it and will give you. Then you say, is there no way? Why are you so passive, I tell you? Or why are you so negative? Only way is called universal precaution. Consider everybody as infected unless proved otherwise. Because if suppose a person get tested today, is negative today, there's no guarantee in the next five days he's not going to get the infection from somebody else whom he has met. So therefore, consider everybody as infected. Now, what will you do then? Unnecessary crowding should be avoided. So our lifestyle has to get changed for the next few years. We should avoid crowding. And that's why we are doing a meeting through video conference. Second is always use mask, always use mask. Third is social distancing is very, very important. Social distancing of about six feet or two meter. Because the reason is when somebody speaks, the aerosol can travel up to six feet. But if you are maintaining a distance more than six feet, the aerosol will not enter inside your body. Now, therefore, asymptomatic people among 250 were 82%. Mild to moderate illness was there in 33 out of 44 who were symptomatic. So most patients who were symptomatic had mild to moderate illness. What is mild to moderate illness? Some nausea, some anorexia, some sore throat, and something like that. Okay? Severe illness as defined by need for oxygen was in 8 out of 252. Very small number. And critical illness that needed ventilator was in five out of 252. So that way we are lucky. That way we are lucky because need for ventilator is less, need for oxygen is less. And if it remains so during the whole epidemic that we will face in the subsequent month, it is better because we, are li we have limited healthcare facilities. But actually it tells you that you have to create your healthcare facility for the future. Because this virus has taught us how important is science, how important is scientific education, and how important is healthcare institution. They are the most important. Now, of the 44 symptomatic patients, 41 patients had non-GI symptom only, means respiratory symptom. 34 had both GI and non-GI symptom and 11 had only GI symptom, 25%. There was no respiratory symptom, only GI symptom. So if you are having sudden onset of nausea, vomiting, passing a few loose stool, have abdominal pain, may suspect that you are having SARS-CoV-2 infection because that occurs in 25%. Now we typically use statistical analysis to see that if there is a GI symptom, does it mean the illness will be more severe? Yes. What we found, severe illness was there more frequently those in whom there was GI symptom. Critical illness was there more frequently among those who had GI symptom. Death occurred in all five death, death patients had GI symptom. None who did not die, GI symptom. So GI symptom is very, very important. It tells you the disease is more severe. Now, we do a multivariate analysis. I'll not go to the technology of multivariate analysis. 
because some people will feel bored. But multivariate analysis principle is two factors may be related. For example, let us say here, uh, there can be the GI symptom occurred in, let us say more often, in people who have comorbid illness, like heart disease, diabetes. And also comorbid illness also determine severity of the illness. Now you have to see, is it the comorbid illness which determine bad outcome? Or is it GI symptom which determine bad outcome? Or both independently determine bad outcome? And we found GI symptom determine bad outcome independently. Now we wanted to see that is the amount of virus present in the throat determine that whether the illness is more severe or GI symptom occurred because there was more amount of virus in the nasopharynx. Because if somebody has more virus in the nasopharynx, he is expected that more virus will go to the GI tract. And therefore, higher concentration of virus, which means higher concentration of RNA, should determine, this is what our hypothesis was, presence of GI symptom. So how do you determine what is the concentration of RNA during real-time PCR? You look at the cycle threshold. What is cycle threshold? Let us say in PCR, what do you do? We amplify that molecule, be it DNA, be it RNA. We are trying to amplify it by running more and more cycle. We amplify it. Let us say you require more cycle to make the RNA test positive. That means you have a low concentration of RNA. If you require lesser number of cycle to get a positive test, you have a more amount of RNA. So cycle threshold in number of cycle by which you know the test became positive in a positive patient. And we have to see cycle threshold among those who had GI symptom among those who had non -G, no GI symptom, and we found no, the amount of virus did not determine presence of GI symptom. Now, another interesting thing I told you that of our 252 patients, only five died. Only five died. Obviously, SGPGI care can match care in any institution in the world, I tell you, because we have the best facilities, we have ventilators, we have a good number of beds, like in our COVID hospital, we have 210 beds, but we currently have all of us only, only 30 or 40 patients. So question is, I would say in certain aspect, it may be better than what was there during the severe pandemic in England or Italy or US. So question is, so with the care that we gave, only five patients died. Now look at the figure in US, almost 10% died. Look at the figure in England, more than 10 or 15 percent died. So that means, can we say death rate was lower in India? I think it is true. You know why? Look at the co corona meter, world corona meter. World corona meter will show you that worldwide, the death rate due to coronavirus disease is 8 percent. In India, it is about 3 percent or less than 3 percent. So the mortality due to coronavirus disease in India is half that in the US or that in the Europe. Now, what could be the reason? What could be the reason? Is it possible that the virus is less virulent in India? Possible. And in fact, we are doing the sequencing of the virus now to know what is the sequence of the virus in our center compared to the Europe or US. Also, we know that Indians have a lesser survival. Like look at Japanese, they have a so average survival will be 90 years. Look at the US, average survival will be more than 75 years. So India, average survival is about 68 years. So we have a younger population and we know usually older population die more often. Obviously, if the population is younger, they will have less comorbidity. Some people hypothesize that because of our BCG vaccination, we are protected. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But what I believe is that it is related to the hygiene hypothesis. What is hygiene hypothesis? Hygiene hypothesis tells that if you are excessively hygienic, then your T-regulatory response will be poor and you will have more allergy 
you will have more autoimmunity. And that's why in US or Europe today, they develop what is called peanut allergy. What is peanut allergy? Peanut allergy means you take peanut, it has protein, and you develop, develop CDVR anaphylaxis. Can you imagine having peanut allergy in India? Because we repeatedly get infected from the childhood, it leads to our immune response understanding then when it has to mount an immune response, and then when it has to switch off the immune response. So this is hygiene hypothesis. That's why autoimmune diseases, allergic diseases are less common in developing countries, including India. And we know that in coronavirus disease, major cause of death is unregulated immune reaction, cytokine storm. So therefore, this can be one explanation. Second explanation could be gut microbiome. There is a small study from Hong Kong, which showed about 10 or 15 patients, which showed there are particular type of microbes, which are associated with less severe coronavirus disease. So that may be one other reason. Now, can you get RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in stool? This was an initial paper from China which showed you can get RNA in many body fluid. You can get in bronchial level lavage fluid, you can get in pharyngeal swab, you can get in sputum, blood, nasal swab. You can even get in feces. You don't get in urine, you don't get in urine. Now this is a meta-analysis, the same meta-analysis from Hong Kong. They showed 50% patient with coronavirus disease had RNA in their stool. That means the people infected with this virus are excreting the virus in their stool to the tune of 50%. Now, those who have GI symptom, they are more likely to have RNA in their stool than those who don't have GI symptom. Also, the amount of RNA is higher if somebody has GI symptom than those who somebody did not have GI symptom. Now, this is how the virus infection goes. This is depiction of RNA positivity and uh, corresponding antibody detection. So what it shows is that antibody persists while RNA persists. So it is not that if somebody get, get an antibody, he doesn't have RNA and he is uh, not infected. Moreover, you have to understand, currently our policy in the country or that matter anywhere in the world is what? If somebody is diagnosed having coronavirus, now you test him for nasopharyngeal RNA. Once the nasopharyngeal RNA becomes negative, you give him leave from the quarantine. You say you can freely move around now because your nasopharyngeal RNA has become negative. This is a study which showed that after the nasopharyngeal RNA became negative, after 11 days, median of 11 days, stool RNA can continue to be excreted. So therefore, stool RNA can continue to be excreted even when your nasopharyngeal RNA has become negative. So what is the problem there? The problem is that if this is the situation, the fellow may excrete the virus in their stool. Fellow may excrete their virus in their stool. So this is a major problem. The reason is that uh, what will happen is that they will lead to fecal transmission of the virus. Even there are studies like one study from Italy, which was the first one, to show that the virus remains in the sewage. So similar to hepatitis E virus, therefore, this virus can also persist in sewage. As I showed you, this virus can go through the GI tract and infect you. This is another method which can lead to infection by this virus. Now, when GI symptoms occur in COVID-19, you may think, okay, this will occur for a short while. And if I recover, the chance of recovery is to the tune of 95 to 98%. So I'll recover and I will not have any more problem. But the problem, the situation may not be the same that you are thinking. We all know GI infection is not as innocuous as we thought. 10 to 20% patient 
who develop acute GI infection can continue to develop chronic GI symptom in the long run, which we call as post-infection irritable bowel syndrome, post-infection dyspepsia. That means once you disturb the GI tract by a foreign organism, the organism may even disappear, but still your symptom may persist. And this was a study that we did in Bangladesh where we found 10 to 20% patient continue to have GI symptom after an acute infectious gastroenteritis. And this study was unique. You know why? Because in this study, for the first time, we found that cholera can be followed by chronic GI symptom. Nobody else in the world showed this because cholera is believed to be a non-invasive bacteria. And therefore, it was believed cholera was very innocuous. It will cause, cause, cause a short-time illness. It will not lead to a long-term illness. And if you look at how does cholera do this? Cholera produces interleukin-6, activation of interleukin-6. Cholera increases 5-hydroxytryptamine. Cholera affects the enteric nerves. Cholera increases the intestinal permeability. So all this cholera can cause. Now, can coronavirus disease cause all this? Yes, it can. It can increase the intestinal permeability. It can irritate the nerves. It can increase the GI inflammation as documented by increase in the fecal calprotectin. And therefore, I think SARS-CoV-2 is more invasive GI pathogen than cholera. Than cholera. SARS-CoV-2 is more invasive GI pathogen than cholera. This is one study from China. Large number of patients, maybe 90 or 100 or 70, I don't exactly remember the number. But in two of them, they did endoscopy. They had to do endoscopy. And they found, these are the lesions which were found on endoscopy in patients of coronavirus infection. So this suggests that there is an invasion maybe by the virus. So GI tract is not remaining intact. So therefore, I tell you, this is a hypothesis article that we have written, and we are, we are expecting it to come in American Journal of Gastroenterology. Now, this article explain why should you consider that post-infection long-term GI sequel can occur following coronavirus infection, okay? This is called post-infection functional dyspepsia, post-infection irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, so that is the long-term consequence. Therefore, I conclude that GI symptoms are not uncommon in patients with COVID-19. Presence of GI symptom is associated with severe COVID-19. Fecal viral excretion is reported in 50% patients with COVID-19. Fecal viral excretion may have potential for fecal transmission. Therefore, my advice is don't eat outside on the roadside where there could be fecal contamination of the food that you are eating. And SARS-CoV should be tested in the feces before many of the GI procedure. Thank you so much.